All right. Greetings to our friends near and far. A pleasant spring-like day here in the panhandle of Idaho. Looks like March is going to go out like a lamb. Hooray. We're all glad to see spring come, of course. And a pleasant day today. So here we are, moving right along, looking forward to the Festival of Unleavened Bread. And uh, excited to understand the truth. Now, so here we are. Today's message is about forgiveness, and here's what I said I was going to do. This is what we posted on the website, at least. I think we all understand that forgiveness is an integral part of our Christian experience. What is it that enables forgiveness? Is it because God is love? Uh, he therefore forgives. Is it because we are, are sorry for bad, sinful behavior, and thus God forgives? Yes, yes, and more, I said. All right. So let's take a look. I managed to reduce my, my, uh, you know, as you as you develop a message, and we speak every three, four weeks, something like that. So you got lots of time to think about it, and things expand. And I thought, well, what's there about forgiveness that people don't already know? I mean, you you sin, you you repent, right? And God forgives. Isn't that pretty much it? What else is there to know? Well, um, <laughs> I'm going to share with you some of the things that. Uh, that have impressed me about the subject of for forgiveness, you know, sin, repentance. You throw all these things together, redemption, sanctification, uh, whatever else, you know, you, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a package, you know. You, it's difficult to just sort out one without impacting and uh, understanding all the things that uh, go along with it. But nevertheless, I'm going to focus on two things that have, have impressed me, you know, it's been 60 years since I sought repentance and forgiveness, uh, you know, as a young, well, I was, what, 19 years old. And last week when Mike was talking about, not last week, but a couple weeks ago, talking about sin, and there's a reference to repentance, or to repentance, and a reference to it being a gift from God. And that uh, concept is um, very meaningful to me. Back Way back in the beginning, it must have been the summer of 1965 would be my guess, one of the articles that I read about, the, about repentance, it was the, the fact that it was a gift uh, it really impressed me at the time. And so for two years, along with the other things I was studying, I, I prayed continuously for two years, not every minute of every day, obviously, but when I prayed, I always included that God would grant me the, the gift of repentance. And I, two years later or thereabouts, I'm at Ambassador College as a freshman and I was baptized there. And so uh, that is, so that's been a foundation of my own personal experience, very much so. And, and I think it's something we do need to understand. Two things, conviction of sin and what makes forgiveness possible. Those are the two things that have that uh, I'm going to focus on today, I think are worth the time and effort. Back in the day when, uh, in the, or the mid 90s, when Worldwide Church of God was going through the throes of, well, of what, disintegration and whatnot, it was the effort of the corporate headquarters to upgrade the education of the ministry. And as I look back, and I, you can certainly applaud that idea, uh, there was a need to upgrade the uh, ministry. I have a copy of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. This is one of the, the volumes, I don't know if it was suggested, but it's certainly one that, uh, that I found useful. And so I began to expand my reading list and to, okay, upgrade my education in terms of what I understood. And you see, there are things that can be learned. I don't agree with everything C.S. Lewis believes. He's a hardcore Trinitarian, all right? I don't agree with that. But he says a lot of other things that are, frankly, quite useful and were useful for me at the time. And so I'll share a little bit with, of this with you because he's talking about forgiveness. Now, what we have in this particular volume, uh, originally it was a series of radio talks that uh, I don't remember the exact circumstances around why he began to do that. But that's what it was. And it, they were given during World War II, 1943, 1945. And then later, the material was compiled into book form 
And it, this is what we have. It's been reprinted numerous times. So he talks about forgiveness. And uh, so I thought I'll share a couple paragraphs here with you just to sort of get the subject going here. So he says, I said in a previous chapter that chastity was the most unpopular of the Christian virtues. Chastity, right? Uh, okay, so continuing, he says, but I'm not so sure I was right. I believe the, the one I have to talk of today is even more unpopular. The Christian rule, quote, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because in Christian morals, thy neighbor includes thy enemy. And so we come up against this terrible duty of forgiving our enemies. Now, granted, this was written now during World War II. He's British, all right? He fought, he was in the infantry in World War I. And so he's a part of the whole war experience. Now, when you take a look at something like World War, you're talking about, you know, the extreme of violation and violence and, and uh, you know, corruption and, and absolute abuse of humanity from, from both sides. You realize, don't you, that if the Axis powers had won the war, the Allies would have been tried for war crimes. See, that's the way it works. The winners try the losers for war crimes, and the winners write history, see? All right, so let's just understand that. We had plenty of things to be tried for. Continuing, he says, so this business of forgiving your enemies. Now, he's speaking as a Brit, as a Brit all right, part of the Allied effort fighting against the Axis powers. Now, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive, as we had during the war, all right? So think about it. Bombing cities and, and concentration camps and all the horror that goes with war. So he says, and then to mention the subject at all is to be greeted with howls of anger. Now, again, we're talking about World War II, during with the war and immediately after when this material was put together. So you can say, so the whole experience of the war is very, very near. It's a very touchy situation. It's raw. It's, it's, it's now, see, where the people are struggling with the aftermath of these things. It is not that people think this too high and difficult a virtue. It is that they think it is hateful and contemptible. What sort of, that sort of talk makes me sick, they say. And half of you already want to ask me, quote, I wonder how you'd feel about forgiving the Gestapo if you were a Pole or a Jew. All right, now think about that. So there were people who suffered at the hands of the Gestapo. Now the Poles, I suppose they were Christian. They weren't Jew, Roman Catholic probably, primarily. And the Jews, of course. You understand. So, indeed, I wonder how you'd feel about forgiving the Gestapo. Now, that, granted, is the extreme example, all right? Horrible atrocities committed by one part of humanity against another. So he says, well, I wonder also very much, just as when Christianity tells me that I must not deny my religion even to save myself from death by torture, I wonder very much how should I do when it came to the point. What if I'm faced with that? How would I really respond? I'm not trying to tell you in this book what I could do. I can do precious little. I'm telling you what Christianity is. I did not invent it. And there, right in the middle of it, I find, quote, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. There is no slightest suggestion that we are offered forgiveness on any other terms. It is made perfectly clear that if we do not forgive, we shall not be forgiven. There are no two ways about it. What are we to do? All right, good question. So we have the, the business of the conviction of sin. Now, why is that important? Well, we're going to see. Because even in such an extreme situation as the aftermath of, a war, of world war, or you can boil, boil it down to an individual situation where somebody has been abused in an a, a, a utterly unholy manner, just even unhuman manner, 
where, you know, whether it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, violence of one sort or another, where, you know, it, it's just unspeakable. Some of the things that one human being might put another human being through. And yet, what are we to do? You know, the issue is, what does God require of me? What, what, what are we going to, how are we going to handle this business? Well, all right, let's turn to John chapter 15. And we'll take a little closer look here. Here's the disciples are gathered with Jesus at the evening he was betrayed. And he is giving them some final advice and, and just talking to them about things that are, are coming and trying to prepare them. All right, chapter 20, uh, 15, verse 26 of John. Uh, there's a subtitle in my Bible called The Coming Rejection. When the Helper comes, that is the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father. Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me, and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. All right, so there is a helper promised, and we're going to, we're going to need help, all right, as it turns out. Verse chapter 16. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Whenever I read the word stumble, I'm, I'm um, put in mind of the King James translation of, of the Psalm 119, 165, I think it is. Great peace have they who love your law. Nothing will cause them to stumble. Nothing, not even severe abuse that is meted out by some other human being. I mean, some people have been really severely uh, trampled upon and abused and, and, and compromised. And it, is a, it becomes a very difficult proposition. It's a stumbling block. It certainly is. And it takes the power of God's Spirit to overcome those things. So, I have spoken to you so that you would not stumble. Occasions for stumbling are going to come. Verse 2. They will put you out of the synagogue. Yes, the time is coming that whosoever kills you will think that he does or offers God service. See? Oh, they deserved it. They were whatever they were. They were blasphemers. They were corrupt in some way or another. And we did God a favor by getting rid of these people. And this is Christ's advice to his inner circle of people. These things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Okay. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, it's coming, you see. The time is coming. When it does come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. There was no need. The day's coming, as he says. I'm going away now. Verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. It's important, you see, um, we, we have to move beyond the, the support of the physical presence of Jesus. Now it's a matter of developing the character and following the example of Jesus as the Holy Spirit develops with us, works with us. All right. That's necessary. I suppose they would have liked him to stay with them, but his, his uh, responsibilities have been fulfilled. Time to move on. Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage if I go away. And all right, we read that. Verse 8. When he has come, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. All right, here we are. Now it says, uh, verse 8 again, he will convict the world of sin. All right, that includes you and me. We're going to be convicted of sin. All right, now, stop and think for a moment. You look at humanity as a general rule, and we have this business of forgiveness, and we you generally think of, well, somebody offended me, and so, well, okay, uh, I'll be big about it and forgive you, you know, and I'll forget about it and move on, right? I mean, this comes up. 
And most of the time, it's a matter of human relations and how we treat one another and who said a bad thing to me and so on. And my mother used to always tell us kids, don't wear your feelings on your sleeve. And I used to wonder, well, what does that mean? Well, it means, you know, you got your feelings on your sleeve. So every time you brush up against something that gets irritated and you get all upset and fidgety and you're offended, etc., just, just don't do that. Well, you know, some people are more sensitive than others. And, and true enough, if indeed a person is dependent on somebody else's opinion about you, about him or her, in order to determine their self-worth and their self-identity, then they're carrying a pretty serious burden. Because if, if I'm criticized, somebody doesn't like some part of me or what I do or what I've done, and it offends me and I get all upset and pushed out of shape all the time, then that's a terrible burden to bear. But at the same time, if we have people who are sensitive, then we need to be careful. That's how you get, you get to know people. You avoid some of those things. You just don't pick a fight. You know, just every truth doesn't have to be revealed. What does it say about, about sin and truth and about covering sin? What does love do? Love covers a multitude of sin. That's a part of this business of forgiveness as well. Sometimes it's just best, never mind. All right, so conviction of sin. Now, again, what, if some human being forgives me of some offense that I was guilty of, how, how does that work in terms of my relationship to God the Father, Jesus Christ, and to my opportunity or potential for salvation? Does it have any effect whatsoever? See, the whole business of being convicted of sin is about your relationship to, to, to our, our God, our Father, to Jesus Christ. Now, relationships among human beings is important as well. But let's get it straight. Most of the time we're concerned about sinning or, or offending or being offended by other people. What does God think about these things? What is our relationship to God in this business? Now, you see, human beings have been getting along reasonably well for, for millennia. Otherwise, we would never have been able to cooperate sufficiently to, to build a civilization of any kind. And yet we have it. And so along the way, if we're going to accomplish anything, we have to overlook certain things. We create laws and regulations, you know, to kind of minimize the issues. And of course, there are problems. But usually within our tribe, we're fairly congenial. And that's, that's good. And otherwise, where would we be? We were always looking fault finding and the like. All right, so we have conviction of sin, and we're going to see how important that is. Now, we've all experienced having our feathers ruffled, you know, suffering, you know, embarrassments and disturbances because of interreactions with, between, with other human beings. Uh, they said things that offended us. They did things to us. They cheated us. They, they abandoned some agreement. Uh, you know, they betrayed our trust, whatever. We, we've all experienced those things to one degree or another. And so uh, maybe, and we've committed those things. And others would be qu quick to point out where we have. I suspect if, if each and every one of us had the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about our true self and about how well we have operated within, uh, let's say, the example of Jesus Christ, we would all be embarrassed to tears and we would hide like David said, I'm a worm and I crawl, I'm not a man, I just crawl out, of, you know, disappear someplace. We don't want to focus there. It's easier to focus on somebody else. If I can find somebody who's worse than I am, then I, well, I see I'm in good shape because I'm, wor I'm not as bad as old Joe over there. Now that's bad news. All right, continuing. Let's go to James chapter 1. Talk about this business of sin for a bit. And again, we're talking about conviction of sin and being convicted by it. And what it amounts to is our relationship to Jesus Christ, to God the Father. James chapter 1. We are seeking forgiveness from our sins, our transgressions. James 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Oh, dear. Really? Why, is, in the, why does he talk about temptation needing to be endured? Well, because it's a continual issue. 
what he's telling us is, is there's no way to avoid rubbing up against evil things, wrong motives, attempts to, to discredit, etc. It's everywhere. Now think of the world that James understood and is writing about compared to our own in terms of the opportunities for being sinful. I mean, we were flooded, overwhelmed by images constantly. And as, the, as mores in general are reduced down to the lowest common denominator, then it would, it, all kinds of nonsense is paraded by you're encouraged to, to compromise, uh, to, you know, do something short of being perfect. So, it, but so he says, nevertheless, you're going to have to face it, endure it, deal with it. For when he has been approved, when will you be approved? When, when are we going to be approved? Are you approved now? Is, you, is, what, is your current status and state with, relative to, to God, to Jesus Christ, is it sufficient to uh, bring the, the final result we're looking for, or is more growth yet ahead? For when he is approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. All right, a crown of life is coming, but in the process, we're going to have to endure temptation. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Okay, so uh, a temptation. Some, something comes that, you know, we're, we encounter that's, you know, there's an enticement to, to pursue a, a, a wrong thought, a wrong act, say the wrong things. All right, so we have to be careful. But... We're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, okay, there's a time it's conceived. It, take, it begins to take root. Then what happens? It gives birth to sin, all right? And sin, when it is full, full grown, for, f brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So it's kind of like quicksand. You get into it, and, uh-oh, this is quicksand. I better run. I better get, get out of here in a hurry, all right? Well, do we or do we not? Or do we play around with it? Do we get as close to the edge as we possibly can without falling off? Well, we have to be careful. And so James is warning us, said, look, these things are there. It's going to happen. Oh, it looks good. God didn't say sin was, uh, wasn't pleasurable. What does it say about Moses? He'd, ra he'd rather be, suffer the difficulties with the children of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season in Egypt. Yeah, God didn't say pork was, wasn't good, wasn't flavorful and, and, you know, good tasting. He just said, don't eat it, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so now let's take a closer look at this business. Well, before we go there, 2 Corinthians. Also, again, I asked a question earlier, why does God, and I will deal with this in more detail, but why does God say, why does God forgive? Is it just because we're sorry? I'm sorry, please forgive me. Does God forgive on that basis? Well, consider this. Paul's writing to the Corinthians. First Corinthians, uh, the letter, the first letter of Corinth to the Corinthians was rather strongly corrective. He pointed out some serious issues that where they were uh, in arrears, and he just laid the, law, laid the law down. Get with the program, folks. We've got to change this. So here we are, chapter 7 of the second letter. And he says, and we'll pick it up in verse, in verse 9. Now I rejoice that you were made sorry by my first letter. See, that's the point. But that your sorrow led to repentance. Oh, okay, sorrow leads to repentance. Uh, for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Sorrow in a godly manner. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. All right, so now, if repentance is necessary, if sin has been committed, if our behavior has, is compromised, you know, in comparison to what God expects of us, then we should suffer, all right? We should feel sorrow, because there's good reason to be sorrow. Guilt's a good thing. 
gets to us and says, uh-oh, it, it tells us something's wrong. So we need to make change. All right, so the sorrow of the world produces death. I'm sorry, I wish I hadn't been caught now. There's all kinds of horrible things going on because I did the wrong thing and I wish it weren't so, and so I'm sorrowful. Godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. To salvation. When is salvation going to come? Are you saved? In one sense, we're saved right now. It's a matter of will you accept it? It's not whether we earn it or not. It's whether will we accept the fact that the price has been paid for us and we can now fully, as long as you're in the flesh. Why did James have to write this, the, his warning about enduring temptation and the like and avoiding the enticements of, that lead to sin and so forth. Why did he have to write about that? Well, guess what? The process isn't complete yet. That when the day comes that the flesh gives way to the spirit, then we can say we're free of this business of sin. Then we can say we're completely and totally forgiven. All right. Verse 11 for observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What dil Now notice what happens when you sorrow in a godly fashion. It produces diligence. What clearing of yourself, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you prove yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, I, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but for that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. All right. All right. So a response is necessary. And, you know, we, you have, we have numerous examples of people who, in Scripture, and we, from our own, ex, our own experience, no doubt, uh, where this godly fear, worldly fear is exemplified. One brief one here before we move on. You're familiar with Esau. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. All right? So Paul writes, I, I, I assume it was Paul, maybe it wasn't, but he certainly could have written it. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. All right, he's hungry. All he could think about was his need for food. And of course, Jacob took advantage of the situation. You know, I'll give you, I'll feed you, but you got to give me your birthright. Okay, he agreed. Verse 17, for you know that afterward, when he, Esau, wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. So there's the outward appearance, tears, a great uh, lofty pronouncements about how sorry I am. But what is the heart? God knows the heart. No, we have to be careful uh, about how we make judgments of this sort. All right, now, in a little more detail, let's go to, to 2 Samuel. Remembering what James said about being enticed by sin and how it leads, or by uh, temptation and how it leads to sin, is the famous example we're all familiar with David and Bathsheba. But there are some things here that at least from my experience, that I, I think I, I had not fully understood. So we have godly sorrow. We have, we have uh, worldly sorrow. We have the whole process of how a temptation leads to sin and death. All right? Now, chapter 11, 2 Samuel, verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon, besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. So he would spent seven years at Hebron, and now he's in Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. And she, well, she's bathing, she's not clothed, right? All right. 
at what point in the process of being tempted and leading, yielding to sin is David at this point? Hmm? Did he go out looking for this? Or did he just inadvertently, it just, there it was, he did, wasn't looking for it. All right, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt up to that point. Now, what is the proper response? It says, you know, he saw a woman bathing, she was very beautiful to behold. So what is he doing? Is he giving praise to God for the wonder of the human body? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Now he's got to decide, well, how am I going to respond to this? Well, you know the story. David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, or Eliam the wife of, of uh, Uriah the Hittite? And then David sent mes mes messengers and took her. Notice, he took her. Now, I, I don't try to read more into it than is presented here, but what? The king desires your, your uh, appearance. You're, you're, you're called to, to, to appear before the king. He took her, it says. She came to him, and he lay with her, for, he was, for she was cleansed of her impurity, and, and then she returned to her house. All right. Now, what's David's attitude at this point? He has yielded to the enticement, gone so far as to invite her to his own private chambers with what in mind? Hmm? Well, you saw what happened. This is premeditated adultery now. Now, Jesus later would tell you, you look on a woman to lust after you. You're already an adulterer. You don't have to do anything beyond that. So David take, takes the full measure here. Verse 5, so what's David's opinion at this point? Well, so he's not upset about anything, is he? I suppose he's pleased about the experience. All, oh, verse 5, and the woman conceived. And she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now what's David thinking? Is there any regret now? Is there any remorse in his, in his experience? Uh-oh. Now, what does he think? Does he, with regard to guilt, let's say? Oh, he knows he's guilty. Now, how is he going to respond? Is he going to minimize the damage? Is he going to repent? Is, is he going to seek uh, godly sorrow and correct the issue that's already gone too far, clearly? So you know the story. Well, all right, uh, Uriah, he's out there in the, in the in the encampment where they're fighting the Ammonites. So bring Uriah in and uh, give him a little R&R &R and send him there, be with his wife, and uh, he'll lay with his wife, and he'll think the child is his, and I'll be okay, see? And now he's con contriving a way to get away with it, see? All right, now what's happening here? Are we taking root? I mean, come on, an enticement has led to, to what? Sin is conceived. It's taking root seriously now. Now he's got to cover up an unwanted pregnancy, which was the result of adultery straight out. Okay, so Uriah is sought, he is summoned, he comes. Oh, I can't do that. Uriah is a man of honor. Look, my soldiers are out there camped in the field, uh, dealing with a battle. I, there's no way on earth I'm going to come and, and, you know, be with my wife, whatever, while they're out there in, the, in those conditions. He refused to do it. Now, now what does David think? His first attempt to cover up the, the sin is uh, has, it's not working. Now what? Now is he, has he now moved with godly sorrow to repent, to change, to get a handle on the situation right now? And what if he had? Oh, dear. Yeah. Uh, well, you can, anytime you repent is a good time to repent if it's done with godly sorrow. So, you know the story. All right, send him out in the thick of the battle and, and uh, you know, attack the, the stronghold, and hopefully he'll be killed. Well, he was killed. So now it goes beyond adultery. Now it's murder. Now he's contrived. Now, although David wasn't the one who yielded the sword or shot the arrow, and who knows, maybe he would have been killed in battle anyway. Ah, uh, but that's not the way God sees it. What's in David's heart at this point, see? He's trying his level best to cover it up and try, trying to get away with, with this terrible situation that he's found himself in. 
All right, so again, like I say, you know the story, Uriah, or, uh, Joab, I'm sorry, Uriah was indeed killed. And so, um, verse 26 of chapter 11. So when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. All right? So she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her into his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. And the thing that David had done displeased Jehovah. Now, what's, what's David's attitude at this point? Uriah's been killed. He's no longer part of the issue. Oh, I got away with it. You know, he's breathing a sigh of relief because now, and, and besides that, if you, here he brings um, uh, Bathsheba into his home, into his house to be his wife. Now, you thought, well, man, that's kind of quick. That's kind of strange. But if you read the chronology of David in Second, First Chronicles chapter 3, he had, there are five sons listed by five women when, while he dwelt in Hebron. Bringing another woman into the, into the harem wouldn't have been seen as particularly unusual for David. This is David. He's the king. Can you see what's happened? Instructions to the king were, don't multiply your horses. Don't multiply your wives. Nah. He, sorry, he has an aggrandized sense of who he is and what he's allowed to do and what he can get away with. Oh, he's in deep trouble now. Now that once upon a time he trusted God, who is this uncircumcised Gentile that he should defy the armies of the living God, he goes out there with a sling and five stones and, lay, and slays the giant, see, trusting God, looking to the one true God, Yehovah. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Have you ever done anything that God was displeased with? I think we'd be shocked if the whole truth was actually presented to us. Hopefully over the years, we've learned to modify our behavior in such a way that, you know, we're minimizing. It's much better, you know, to make little adjustments along the way than to come up with a situation like David is faced with here and you're, you're guilty of horrible sins and, you know, adultery, murder. All right, let's continue the story. And again, I think we're all familiar with it. Chapter 12, so the Lord sent Nathan to David. So, remember, repentance is a gift. Right? So Yehovah says, okay, I'll send Nathan the prophet to David. And so he came and he said, there were two, you remember the story, there were two men in a city, one rich, one poor. The rich man had lots of flocks and herds and whatnot. Now he had a special guest coming to visit. And instead of taking from his own flock to provide the needs, um, it says in verse 4, a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one of the wayfaring, for the wayfaring man, uh, who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come with him. Now, again, let's go back to verse 3. And notice wh what place this lamb stood in this man's family. The poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. It grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food, drank of his own cup. It was like a daughter to him. Now, what happens when David learned, Nathan tells the story, and he says, look, and the rich man took the poor man's lamb and slaughtered it and fed it to his guests. Then what was David's response? So David's anger was greatly aroused. Now, here's a, here's a characteristic of David you want to be aware of. Is you don't want to get close. You never want to get close to the inner circle because trouble happens. David's already gone way, way beyond the boundaries set either as king or as a basic human being in God's sight. And now his anger is greatly aroused against the man. He said to me, as Jehovah lives, that man who has done this will surely die. All right, now what's going on here? What's David's attitude? David's attitude now, okay, he's let his anger get away from him. He knows the truth. What does he say? He shall restore it fourfold. Okay, that's the law. Exodus 22, verse 1. You steal a lamb, you eat it, you sell it, 
you're going to restore it fourfold. But st stealing, theft is not a capital crime. But David thinks he knows better than God and God's law, and we'll, uh, he has so offended my sensitivities, we're going to kill him. Let's get rid of him. All right? So David thinks he's, he's uh, ridding the, uh, uh, the world of a nasty, uh, you know, offender. Now what? As Jehovah lives, Nathan said, well, verse uh, 7, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. And then he pro pro pronounces the impact of what he has done. And we'll go through it quickly. I gave you your master's house. I delivered you from Saul, first of all. Gave you your master's house and his wives in your keeping. Gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of Yehovah to do the evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Sin is to despise God. It is a, you know, yet he doesn't say anything about sinning against Uriah and against Bathsheba. Now, he did. He offended them. I mean, I, I suppose Uriah was killed, didn't even know anything had happened. He won't know until he's resurrected, and we tell the whole story, perhaps. Again, it's about our relationship to Almighty God. I mean, human beings have forgiven one another over the centuries and never known anything about the true God. We have to do that sort of thing. We have to overlook the foibles of our neighbors and our family members, or, or what? Or we're in a constant bickering state. Nothing gets done. All right. So here's David. Now, where is he? Now, let's, again, the point is, we're talking about being convicted of sin. We're talking about, you know, godly sorrow. Now, what do you think David's added attitude is? Thus says the Lord, and he, I will bring diversity against you and so on. So David said to Nathan in chapter, or verse 13, I have sinned against Jehovah. And Nathan said to David, and Yehovah has put away your sin, and you shall die, or you shall not die. All right. So evidently, David has gone very quickly <laughs> from believing that he'd gotten away with murder, quite literally, to being convicted. I mean, well, he put himself under the death penalty, did he not? And so, whereas God spared his life, now he's going to have to put up with some horrible conditions and circumstances. We'll touch on his his response here in a little bit, a little bit more because there are psalms that are written, uh, Psalm 51 in particular, in David's response to this situation where he came horribly to, to grips with his own shortcomings and and powerfully so. So I've sinned against Jehovah. So all right, now you will not die. So God has forgiven you. Okay, now keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that concept in a bit. But now, continuing. Now the death of David's son. So Nathan departs. And then in the middle, middle of part, verse 15, he says, And Yehovah struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. And in verse 18, it says, On the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. Now you read over that, and you say, Oh, yeah, okay, poor, poor child died. Now, the skeptic, the critic, the, um, you know, the, the, somebody who, ha who has no respect for anything godly, etc., would, would look at that situation and say, aha, what kind of a god strikes a child, an infant, newborn infant, that it dies within a week? Who would do that? Now, the thing that struck me personally about that statement, the, and Yehovah struck the child, it became ill, and on the seventh day, the child died. It wasn't that the child was not well formed or developed and had a weakness and just died. No, it says Yehovah struck the child. God, if you will, you want to use a different word? He killed him. 
What kind of a God would do that? Now, if you're prone to asking questions in difficult situations that bring God's actions into judgment, you are not thoroughly convicted of sin. Now, think about that. Always complaining. I don't like the way God's doing this, and I don't like the way God's doing that. And God's not fair, and why do I have to suffer this, and why do I have to suffer that? Do you understand? If that's our approach, if we are disposed to that sort of understanding, it's like David thinking that he's better than God, and he can pass the death penalty, death penalty if he so chooses, even if it's not a capital crime. We get to thinking too highly of ourselves. It's extremely important. So we get back to, you know, I was thinking, poor Linda has to put up with my, with my rehearsals of these messages and whatnot, and that's one of the way I prepare is I rehearse it. I just start preaching right there in the middle of the room, and, and whoever's there has to listen, okay? So I say, uh, uh, I don't remember how the subject came up, but it had to do with how you feel, you know, if you're driving and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, a, say, a, a domestic cat runs in front of the car and you run over it, how does that make you feel? You know, it's really sad. Or you, you see some critters you know, being terribly afflict, afflicted or something. And so we, we can feel deeply s sorrowful about the death of an animal. But when it comes to the death of Jesus Christ, well, that was so long ago. Does it make you feel anywhere near the same to contemplate Jesus Christ's death, his suffering, and what it meant for you and me personally? Can you? Is there any sense of of just how horrendous that was. And you see, brother, the point number two that I hope to make is that's the reason forgiveness is possible. It's because Jesus Christ died. It's not because God is love. It's not because you are sorry. It is because Jesus Christ died, paid the penalty. Now, let's think about David, for example. Jesus hadn't been there yet. He hadn't died yet, at least not from a human perspective. But remember, God lives in eternity, not in time. What's the statement we have in Revelation 13? The Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Far as God was concerned, again, living in eternity, not in time. You and I live in time. David was living in time. So he didn't know anything about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Or maybe he did, but a little differently, I suppose, than the way, the way we understand it. But because he was going to be sacrificed, as far as God was concerned, he was sacrificed. That's what made it possible for David to finally to be forgiven. Repentance was granted. God took the time to send his prophet, and if you will, to use the vernacular, he nailed his hide to the wall, caught him in his own trap. So now, again, conviction of sin. Am I thoroughly convicted again of sin? What's my attitude toward God? You see, it's reflected in how we how we uh, associate, how we um, uh, respond to and relate to, to, to God, to, to Yehovah, to Jesus Christ. And uh, again, if we're always dissatisfied, if we're always complaining and coming up with ways to, to uh, be, you know, just, well, just not happy with the way God's doing things, I think you should do something different than this. Then you're just simply not convicted of sin. That's what it amounts to. Now, let's face it. I've been in this process for 60 years now, 60. And I've come to see, and I suspect you have too, they're, they're, if you're going to grow in grace and knowledge, then over time you have to get a deeper understanding of some of these things. And I have found that in my current state, we have this little exercise program that we do. It's on a disc, and, and uh, it's uh, designed for seniors with limited mobility. Ah, yes, I am a senior. 80 must make me senior, right? And I am definitely of limited mobility. Limited seems to be the, the defining characteristic of my current existence. I have limited hearing. I have limited sight. I have limited mobility. And quite frank, and, you know, I have limited strength. I have limited, uh, yes, men mental capacity as well. I can see it. So God uses those things to say, okay, big fella, you're not as big and smart and, and, and special as you think. Now, just calm down, because anything you accomplish from here on, it's going to be because I'm doing it through you, if I hadn't understood that before. So, again, we grow. The Spirit of God, there's a, 
a reason the Spirit of God dwells in us. Without that, you're not going to understand. But I think we all need to take a close look at our whole attitude toward everything and make sure that we're in harmony with how, you know, with, with the way that God would have us do it. Now, one more example. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to forego uh, Psalm 51. You can go read it for yourself, but it, it talks about David, and it describes his um, godly sorrow, if you will. But I want to go to Luke chapter 22, and it, we're going to take, another, take a look at another uh, serious or familiar example. And this is, this is the Peter. Chapter 22 of Luke, the Passover season has come, and this, the hour is approaching when he would be arrested and, and hauled off to be crucified. Now, again, the, 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 the thing that we're investigating here is conviction of sin. You know, when am I convicted of sin? When have I truly given up my personal understanding and idea about things and just fully, completely yielded to God? Whatever you say, yes, Lord, All right? All right, so we're in chapter 22 of Luke. Now, the... Um, all four Gospels deal with Peter's situation here at the end, but Luke's is particularly poignant in one point, and we'll note that when we get there. So Luke, uh, chapter 22, verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down with his 12 apostles with him, all right? And then uh, verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Oh, now that's interesting, isn't it? Satan has asked for you. I want Peter. I'm going to sift him. Now, why do you think? Did, did Satan have some, uh, what was it, some benefit going to come out of this sifting? Satan was looking for an opportunity to rough him up. Uh, and who knows what all. Verse 32, so Jesus goes on to say, I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith shall not fail. He didn't pray that Satan would not sift him. He prayed that when the sifting does come, your faith will not fail. Now what, notice what he says. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Jesus knew his faith was going to fail. Peter wasn't yet thoroughly convicted of sin, of his true nature relative to his Savior, whether you're looking at this firstborn son of God or whether you're looking at Jehovah himself. He wasn't thoroughly convicted as yet. When you have returned, now you see, you can't return to something if you've never been there. And so Peter, at this point, at least, is in, in the, the relationship with Jesus that he's supposed to have. But he's going to, his faith is going to fail, and then he's going to have to return. Okay? And as the story is told, he did return. All right. Now let's take it a little further and see how, how it plays out. So, um, but now, verse 33, now here's Peter. He says, but Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Oh, no sweat. I am convicted. I am absolutely, uh, you know, I'm thoroughly involved in this process. Not prison, not death could turn me away. Jesus said to him, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times. All right, three times. It's all right. You know the story. Well, let's, let's notice. Verse 57. Well, verse 54, having arrested him, they led him and brought him forth into the high priest's house. Peter followed at a distance. Now, it doesn't say the other disciples did, but maybe they did or didn't. But Peter was there, certainly. How, Luke it wasn't there, so how did Luke know these things? He probably talked to Peter later and noted some of these things. So, verse 55, they kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard. It's early spring, and it's cool out. And they sat down together. Peter sat among them. A certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat there by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man also was with him. Now, I, I don't know. Well... I don't know what difference it made, whether this servant girl noticed or not, or what, what maybe Peter thought if they would uh, treat him the same way Jesus was being treated, right? Whatever. Woman, I do not know him. 
number one. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You are also of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Number two. Verse 59. And after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Now what do you think's in Peter's mind? Now, see, he's making denial. Why is he denying this? He's afraid of what's going to happen to him. I might end up being treated like Jesus is being treated. I really don't want to go there. In spite of my proclamation just, what, an hour or two earlier, that I would go, I would march into hell with you if that was required. And suddenly, his faith has failed him. The rooster crows. And Peter remembered the word that the Lord had said to him, Behold, well, before we get to that, verse 61, here's the one that, here's the one that, that Luke points this out, the other, the other accounts do not. It says, verse 61, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Oh, so Peter followed along, he see it, and so Jesus makes eye contact with him. Now, what do you think that was, what, do you th how, what effect did that have on Peter? Can you, can you imagine? Yes, he's like Psalm 22 points out, uh, speaking it's a Psalm of David. It's also a prophecy about Jesus, what would happen to him. But, you know, he was a worm, right? I don't, I don't deserve to stand and walk amongst men, crawl on my belly like a worm. And so what did Peter do? He remembered, so Peter went out and wept bitterly, okay? Now, is Peter convicted of his sin? Peter was, Peter, he was sifted. I suppose you could say what was going on with various individuals in the crowd there trying to associate him with Jesus, you might, that might have been the sifting. I don't know how you uh, characterize it exactly, but it was certainly a test of Jesus, of Peter's faith, and he, he failed. Well, all right, you know the story. You know, he eventually did come back, and he did feed his sheep. You know, and of course, that was what Jesus said in one of his last comments and conversations with Peter. Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep, right? Three times. You denied me three times. <laughs> three times you're going to admit that here we are. What are we going to do now? All right, conviction of sin. So have you been convicted of sin? I mean, you know. I, I mean, I'm not here to, to judge whether or not you have or not. I'm just saying it is a serious issue. And if we aren't happy with what God's doing with us, I mean, what did, you know, the Apostle Paul, and it's worthy, that's worthy of note. Let's turn to, to, uh, to Romans and and recognize um, that there comes a time when, um, you know, God really doesn't care whether we agree with what's being done or not. He doesn't really care, uh, you know, whether we think it's a good idea or not one way or another, because in actual fact, you know, he's the one that's in charge, and he's going to do what he's, what he's going to do. All right, so we see chapter 9 of Romans. He says in, uh, it says in verse um, 18, Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens, all right? For this current purpose, some people he has mercy on, others he has not. Well, how can that be? What kind of a God does that? You know, if that's your attitude, then you really aren't convicted yet. Verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he, does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed to say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Why this? Why that? Why the other thing? It's the, that's the way a three-year-old responds with its mother. M drives mother crazy. Asking why, 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 why? You know, okay, it's of a three-year-old, you can expect it. All right, of an immature 
or a Christian on the milk of the word, maybe God will tolerate some of that. But the di time comes when you don't ask why, you ask what is the proper response. And then we get along, we get and we move along. And if we're forever calling God into question, why do you do this and why do you do the other? I got to submit to you, uh, we better consider whether or not we've truly been convicted. And then we could be maybe get a little more urgent about requesting the gift of repentance. All right, now, why and how forgiveness? Point, uh, two points. Number one, the conviction of sin, what it means. In the course of events, a couple of things. This little, this little volume is called My Utmost for His Highest, comp compilation of material put together by Oswald Chambers and his wife after he died. And he talks about the conviction of sin and what makes repentance possible. And I, I can't say it any better than this, so I'll just quote what he said. Conviction of sin is one of the rarest things that ever strikes a man. It is the threshold of an understanding of God. Jesus Christ said that when the Holy Spirit came, he would convict of sin. And when the Holy Spirit rouses a man's conscience, conscience and brings him into the presence of God, it is not his relationship with men that bothers him, but his relationship with God against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Quoting this 51st Psalm. All right. All right. So. It's, and again, again, we need to understand these things, see? And he said also, the great miracle of the grace of God is that he forgives sin. And it is the death of Christ alone who enables the divine nature to forgive and to remain true to itself in doing so. It is shallow nonsense to say God forgives us because he is love. If God can forgive us simply because God is love, or if he can forgive us simply because we are sorrowful, then what does that do to the significance of the sacrifice of Christ? Well, that's not necessary. God, well, no, God set it up so that conviction of sin, the presence of forgiveness itself, was based on the fact that God has allowed his son to be sacrificed to make it all possible. Ephesians chapter 1. We'll begin to wrap it up here. Just again, focusing on this business of why is, is uh, forgiveness even possible? Because it doesn't depend on you being sorry. Now, that's necessary, all right. But let's understand, it's not because we're sorry that God forgives. It's because Jesus Christ paid the penalty. God is a just God. Right? Sin requires recompense. You sin, you pay. What's, what's the solution? Sin is the, the wages of sin is death. What's the solution? Jesus Christ pays the penalty through his sacrifice. Ephesians 1, verse 7. In him, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. All right? What does it say? Redemption is through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. I don't care how sorry you are. Esau was sorry. Judas was sorry. But it didn't lead to, to repentance. Hebrews chapter 9. So once again, uh, our relationship to, to God is, is critical. And again, if we see ourselves as something special and we can decide for ourselves what's right and wrong and all that sort of thing, uh, we haven't been convicted of anything. Chapter 9 of Hebrews verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Verse 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. 
He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin and by the sacrifice, and that by the sacrifice of himself. All right? All right. God so loved the world that he forgave us of our sins. No, oh, no. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to pay the price to make possible forgiveness. You see. All right, finally, Galatians chapter 6. So once again, uh, you know, at least in my own experience, I realize this business of forgiveness, okay, it boils down. It's not so much how we relate to one another human beings, and, and that's important too, obviously, as we're going to see here in, in Galatians 6. But this is, this is a measure of our relationship to God. Brethren, Galatians 6, 1. If a man is overtaken in any trespass, all right, and he's talking to a church, of, to the ecclesia, you know, the, the, the assembly of God here. So if one of your members is overtaken in trespass, you who are spiritual, restore one, uh, such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You know, the only times that I've ever tried to confront somebody because of their shortcomings or their sin, I, I was never received with... Uh, with much uh, understanding. Who are you to point out my sins? You know, it's usually the way it works. But nevertheless, these things do happen. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, sin lays upon a person a horrible burden. Forgiveness can come. Right relationship can be restored with God. But you know, the knowledge the, of, of the horrible things that may have been done in the past are still there, and that just makes it very difficult. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Well, if God has to reduce us literally to nothing for us to see that, believe me, he will do it, as he did with David, as he did with Peter, and as I suspect... If you're honest and you are indeed in a right, right relationship with God, you won't have any difficulty understanding where at that moment or maybe several moments when God reduced you to nothing so that you would understand your proper relationship to him. Verse 4, but let, let each one examine his own work. Then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Indeed. All right, so we should be, you know, stirring up, stirring one another to, what is it? Uh, to good faith and good works. And it's a, it's a long process. Sometimes it's not so easy. When Jesus said, drink, my, drink this cup, uh, well, you know, we have to take, <laughs> I mean, God has a work he's accomplishing, in us, and, it, and we, he's got to do it in spite of our human nature. He's got to do it in spite of the devil, and he will. You know, God takes on a work, he's going to complete it. That's what he said. So, very good, brethren. Let's um, give thanks to God for his benevolence, truly. And it is a great thing that we have come in under, uh, you know, God's grace, under the umbrella of his of his patience, if you will, and holiness secure until the time when the flesh finally is put away, the spirit, and we become spirit, and then, you know, forgiveness in the full sense of the word will be achieved because it's no longer possible to sin. So we're looking forward to that day. In the meantime, it might be a bit of a struggle, but God has promised never to forsake us nor to leave us. So with that, You'll carry on.